Good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming to the sports gambling panel titled Insider Trading, Sports Odds Making, and Gambling. My name is Mike Wall. I'm a first year MBA student at MIT Sloan and the panel lead for today's panel. Today, we have a remarkable set of characters and people that I know a lot about the gambling industry and sports gambling in particular. Our moderator, Jeff Ma, CEO of Tenexer. Matthew Holt from Cantor Gaming is a director and also a head of the Las Vegas Sports Consultants. Chad Millman, Editor-in-Chief of ESPN the Magazine, and Bob Stoll, the owner and founder of Dr. Bob Sports. And with that, I'm going to pass on to Jeff Ma, and we're going to jump right in the panel. Thank you. Sure. It's, uh, it's pretty exciting to have a panel like this in our second year, obviously, at this conference. And you know, seeing uh, Dr. Bob on Thursday night at the VIP reception and hub-nubbing with people from the league was pretty interesting experience. Uh, Matt, why don't you get us started and talk to us a little bit about just sort of how an opening line's made. I mean, you guys are sort of Las Vegas sports consultant, the legendary people that create that opening line. Sure, we use, uh, you know, we compile a lot of data. We use our algorithm models, obviously, and we come up with a number. And what we do is once the opening number is established, what happens is we have uh, lower limits than we normally would. And we sort of allow the market to uh, to set itself. You know, we'll come out with a benchmark number and uh, the public and the betting people will come in and uh, sort of let the market settle to where the number is going to be. So what factors go into that opening line that, you know, just that, that number itself? Is there, you know, it's a, just a straight formula or like what types of actual stats go in? Primarily, it's primarily a straight formula using the uh, algorithm model, but there also is some uh, anticipatory effect built in obviously with some teams uh, in some situations or where you anticipate getting money on some team so you may shade the number that your formula comes up with in anticipation of the money you're probably going to receive from the public on one side and that line um, doesn't really have anything to do with what you think is going to happen right it has much more to do with what, what you think is going to balance the action uh, well, that's sort of a myth as well uh, you know some of our algorithms are so good and we have so much confidence in them that uh, you know, none of these games ever land 50-50. In a dream world, of course, they'd all land 50-50, action on both sides, and we would take, you know, the minus 110 and, and be happy with it. But that rarely ends up being the case. So what we have to do is set a number where we think that, you know, it's going to lean toward the algorithm and where we're comfortable absorbing that risk on that side. Right. Now, Bob, when you see a number, what, what is your process in sort of figuring out which games you want to bet on and, and how do you go th to do that? Well, in, in basketball season right now, for instance, I, I kind of a filter. I can't look at all 50 games or 60 games on a, you know, on a Thursday or Wednesday. Um, half of what I do is technical. So I, I, I go through the situational patterns that I've discovered to see if games apply to that. And once I've done that, then I start going through each of those games to see if I think the line is fair. And, you know, different from what, I mean, I come up with sort of the same numbers that, that generally everybody else comes up with when I look at the whole season as a whole, but my database I can mark whether players have been in or out and only use games when specific lineups have played. Uh, so I get a little bit different number based on current personnel, which, which I think creates a little bit of an edge. Uh, so as long as the line is fair, if the situation is good and the line's fair, I might make a bet on that. Or if I think there's line value, even if there's no particular situation, I might make a bet on that as well. Just depends on how different my line is from what the actual line is. So where do you think you get the most edge? Like what, what types of things create a situation where they've made a line that you can expose? Um, you know, as a, through the year, I mean, years ago, the, the, the technical stuff really worked, especially in the NFL. You know, and, they've, and, the, and the lines have gotten so much sharper now. It used to be a very contrary sport. Um, for instance, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, you could just take teams with negative turnover differentials against teams with positive turnover differentials and probably go 55% blind. Now everybody's gotten wise to that and they've adjusted the line for that stuff. So now what I'm getting, having the Wait, most for, success what, with... Explain a little bit what that means. What's that? What, explain what you're saying in terms of negative turnover differentials. Oh, well, it will, used to be that, you know, people just used to look at scores of games. And, you know, there might be a team that has won and covered the first six weeks of the season. I think the Minnesota Vikings did this in the late 80s. They, they won and covered the first six weeks of the season. They were winning by 14 to 20 points every week. But they were also plus 12, I think, in fumble margin, meaning they had recovered 12 more fumbles than their opponents through six weeks. Well, that's something that's, that's not going to continue. But at, at that point, more of the, you know, the point spreads are more based on scores than they were actual performance uh, on the field without the luck. Um, 
So luck was involved more in the line, where now that, that sort of variance of turnovers is taken out of the line more now, because they've kind of wised up to that, that kind of contrary analysis. And the odds makers are a lot better at that. Um, so what I've done, I had more success with recently, is adjusting my math models for current personnel. Uh, certain, you know, in football, for instance, there's certain positions where there's more value in a position I think people think there is. Like cornerbacks, for instance, are way more important than people think, whereas linebackers tend to be less important relative. You know, star linebacker doesn't make that much of a difference. Patrick Willis went out for the Niners, didn't make a difference. Jerome Harrison went out for the Steelers, didn't make a difference. But you can get an average cornerback, uh, you know, that doesn't play for three or four games and the defense falls apart because the bat, you know, there's just not as much depth at corner uh, in the NFL as there are in other positions. So taking advantage of stuff like that um, has made a difference. Chad, do you have comments on these guys' process and what you've seen? I honestly, from the conversation so far, I feel like my head is going to explode. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. It's because 10 years ago, as Bob just said, nobody was talking about turnover differentials. And nobody is thinking about going so, going to the minutia of personnel when they are handicapping a game. Nobody is talking about algorithms when they're making lines. And so the way the industry has expanded and exploded, there is a merging of sort of the wise guys, where the professional gamblers like Dr. Bob, and the squares and the schmucks that are everyone else. There's all these MIT guys out there now who are working in finance or who are working in private equity and they have these algorithms on the side that they have built and so they are flooding the marketplace with their visions and their data and their formulas and they're making the lines much sharper and they're making it much more difficult for guys like Dr. Bob to find an advantage that lasts over a 24 hour period. They're making it much more difficult for guys like Matt to keep a line that where they might be able to balance it a little bit better. And so all of a sudden there's like this, this middle ground of sharp amateurs that exists all because of the algorithms that Matt is talking about and the advantages that Dr. Bob is finding that now everybody is finding. You know, and I get it, it, spreadsheets from people that they have spent years mining data and building their own formulas about statistical regressions. And it's you know, phenomenal to see the advancements in these ideas. I still just think, you know, we were talking a little bit before, is me looking at the games and saying, all right, I'm giving the eyeball test to these guys. I see the stats that I like to pay attention to, which aren't sort of the counting stats that you see in a regular NFL.com or ESPN.com where Peyton Manning or Tom Brady is thrown for 300 yards a game. That's the guy I want to bet on. It's the, the stats are different than that. I'm sure you're going to ask about that. But um, I still think that the guys who do it well, whether they're using the algorithms and the, the, the technical components and the fundamentals, or if they're just guys who are examining it based on feel and research and reading quotes from coaches and seeing who's going to be hurt and trying to glean some mental intuition out of it all, nobody's hitting more than 55-60%. If you get 60%, you're a hero. 55%, you're making a living. And so it's better to me, to sort of the, it's becoming more difficult to do that, but I just wonder, is it better or is it worse? That I don't know the answer to. So Matt, I mean, what, like, Chad kind of listed some different types of people. Like, who are the people that you guys fear at the M? Well, well, I agree with Chad, first of all. I mean, 10 years ago, let's face it, we could take, uh, you know, you could take your very popular teams and just fade the number toward them and toward the over, and it was just such a generic thing. The public would walk in, they would bet the popular teams, they would bet the over, so you could fade toward both, and it was really a simple bookmaking formula. But like he said, the betting public now is smarter than they've ever been. They're more informed. Uh, you know, so it has to keep us on our toes all the time. We constantly have to have the best algorithms. We have to have the best injury and information gathering tools. We have to get injuries and information before, you know, before Dr. Bob does. I need to know Kobe's out. So yeah, I mean, I agree with them. The betting public has definitely changed. Uh, I don't know that we fear anybody. We've never turned anybody down for a bet, and uh, we'll take a million dollars. So do you fear Dr. Dr. Bob? I don't fear Dr. Bob. If Dr. Bob wants to come to M, we'll give him an account, and he could bet a million dollars on a game as well as, uh, as anybody else. Uh, Dr. You know. Bob, do you want to bet a million dollars on a game? 
<laughs> <laughs> That's too much of a percentage of the bankroll for one game. But <laughs> what um, what do you think about it? You know the the types of things that that you've done over time. Like what what are the you know Chad was kind of talking about some of the stats and things like that. What are some of the stats that you've seen that you look at that are, are well years ago. Um, you know, I, I did a lot of stuff with yards per play and breaking it down with, you know, rushing and pass, not just yards per play, but, you know, yards per rush and yards per pass play, uh, you know, and using matchup analysis. Uh, for instance, if, if you have a great pass defense and you're playing Air Force who runs the option and they run 85% of the time, your great pass defense doesn't do you really much good. So I had some success with doing that kind of matchup analysis. But as I wrote about this stuff in the 90s and early 2000s, more of this stuff became kind of public knowledge and this yards per play stuff started to get worked into the line. I mean, I'm not going to be hitting 65% in college football anymore like I was, you know, 10 years ago. Um, because, that, you know, when, you're, when you've had that much success for an extended period of time, people start going, okay, well, what's this guy doing that's different? And they kind of figured out a lot, some of the stuff that I was doing and sort of incorporating it. Uh, and, you know, as, you know, as technology, you know, grew and the Internet grew and data became more available to everyone, a lot of people were doing the same sort of stuff that I used to do by hand, you know, originally. Um, and so th that kind of edge has been taken away. You know, I do slightly different things now. Like I said, you know, just being on top of injuries and personnel, I think, really, really helps. And, and studying what types of uh, injuries matter more. Um, but, you know, from a there are certain statistics that I still use that I think are a little bit under the radar, but I don't necessarily want to divulge those things. So do you, Matt, do you think that in terms of, Chad, maybe you can feel free to um, pipe in on this too. Injuries is an interesting one because I feel like it's potentially a great opportunity, but also it's common knowledge, right? Everybody, it's not like sure. all, it's not like in the old days, you like, someone would like say, hey, call, call someone up who's on campus and be like, oh, I just saw this guy in the infirmary or something like that. Yeah, right? absolutely. Anytime, you know, a star player is hurt, essentially, for, a, you know, a marquee team, everybody knows, and the information gets out there really quickly. Uh, injuries is interesting because people put different uh, values on different players, so it really affects the line differently. Uh, so I think injuries are really important, but injuries can be overvalued too. Shooting guards in the NBA. Do you think that's that's what I was going to get at? Do you think that they're often overvalued? I.e., if you could bet on a team without their best player, would that be a good strategy? Uh, sometimes it is. You're right. Uh, and sometimes what happens also is if you know if you bet on a team, you know if Kobe Bryant's out and you're the first one, you know you one of the first ones to bet, you're going to get a great line. But a lot of times what will happen is two hours after it's announced Kobe Bryant's not going to play, the line will have over-adjusted, and you can actually get a nice uh, line the other way. You know, the public overreacts to some of these injuries as well. This is, this is where sort of the guys who want to be wise guys and the wise guys separate themselves, is when you're examining personnel, like, like Bob was saying. Because the people like Bob are doing this, it's not like he's sitting at home and just watching a game and then putting his million dollars on a game. He's examining these things for 14, 15 hours and especially for football, he's doing it in July. You know, he's going through literally every single team. And then for preseason football, these guys are watching every single game in preseason. And this is, when I, when I first started covering the gambling world, this is what was most interesting to me was these guys are studying this not because they want to make a first half bet on the third preseason game because they know that's the game where Andy Reid decides to play his starters and then pulls them and so they're going to have a better opportunity to make money in that game. They're watching it so in the ninth game of the year when the starting left guard for the Niners goes out they understand who the backup is. And so they're, they're taping every single preseason game and watching all of them, and that's where they find their advantage. Because like Bob was saying, it's not the linebacker who matters. There is a very specific value for just about every single player on the field. And sometimes when the quarterback goes out, it's not going to be nearly as important as when the left guard goes out. Because that impacts the running game in a way that the quarterback never could, and that impacts the line. And all of a sudden, there's a <coughs> domino effect that's how the wise guys end up separating themselves is because they're much more aware of the second strings and the third strings, and that's why the, the value in these players can be overvalued if it's just the star player who ends up 
getting injured. Sure, I agree with that. And th there's also a lot more emphasis on college players' injuries. You know, in college, if you lose a key player, especially college basketball, the guy coming in may be, uh, you know, a walk-on or a guy who's never going to play again after he graduates. So the differential between that player's ability and the player that's replacing him is huge. Sort of, to use a baseball term, VORP, you know, value over a replacement player. I think in college, you get these huge differentials between you know, a star player and the guy who may have to replace him. Whereas in the NFL, NBA, professional sports, normally the VORP for the player replacing the star is usually pretty good. He was a star in college. He was the best player on his teams. So, you know, that's something that has to be taken into consideration, too, as well. As Bob's it. killing it on Loyola right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you have, a, you have a good antidote with the sort of the Kevin Durant situation in terms of adjusting for injuries or people being out. Yeah, well, you know, like talking about being overvalued and injuries being overvalued, years ago, I mean, in my database, I can mark when a player's been in or out. So I have five slots, where, no, I can five different, designate five different players for any team, in or out, in or out. And over the years, it just became pretty evident that Allen Iverson was an average player, but they'd adjust the line three points whenever he was out. And so I just bet again. I just bet on Philadelphia every time that Allen Iverson didn't play because he didn't make a difference. And a couple years ago, um, there's there's a few stars in the league like that now. Uh, Carmelo Anthony, uh, Monte Ellis for the Warriors. When he's out, the Warriors cover. Um, but in Kevin Durant's first two years, hold on, I gotta write that down. <laughs> <laughs> in Kevin Durant's first two years, the uh, the Thunder were. You know, they were much better offensively when he was in the game. I, I think six points per 100 possessions better when, when Durant was on the floor. But defensively, they were nine points worse per 100 possessions when he was on the floor. He missed nine games. I think it was his second year. He missed nine games, and Oklahoma City covered the spread seven out of nine because they adjusted the line, and they were actually better without him. And they went under the total eight out of nine times because the defense was so much better when he wasn't playing, and the offense was, was worse. So if you, if you look at you know, stuff like that, there are, there are great sites out there that, that study this sort of stuff, and not just simple plus minus and how teams do offensively and defensively, but you know, basketballvalue.com is a great resource, and they do, they do a model that adjusts for not only whether a player's in or out. I mean, if you're playing with LeBron James and your plus minus is going to be pretty good, as you know, like Mo Williams a few years ago with Cleveland, his plus minus was great because he went out when LeBron went out, and he went in when LeBron went in, and, he basically piggybacked on LeBron's plus minus. But this algorithm takes each, each time there's 10 players on the, on the floor, that's one data point. And when anyone leaves, it's an, another data, another, there's another set of data that starts. So it's, it takes into account the four guys you're playing with and the five guys you're playing against. And, and there's an algorithm that solves for that particular player. So you get an adjusted plus minus. And, this, and that's really useful. You get, an, you, you know, there's a lot of variance in that too, I mean, depending on how many minutes a guy plays, but you can get a lot of value on stuff like that. And, and once a guy's been out, I say, well, this guy's supposed to be an, a star, but I, he's negative based on this. And I'll look a few games and see if that's the case. And if, if it proves to be the case, then I'll start using that. What, um, back to whether you're scared of Dr. Bob or not. Um, so you said you're not really scared of anyone. But as we were talking uh, before coming up here, you said that there are you know, 15 to 20 people that you think win consistently. So what are some strategies that you see them use, or what are some things that, if some unknown started betting with you, that might mark them as a sharp to you? You know, one of the reasons that, uh, you know, we're not scared of anybody is our alg algorithms are so good, and, you know, we're so confident in our number. Uh, you know, normally people that are successful uh, have the ability to line shop, first of all. Uh, you know, you always want to be able to shop for the best line. That half a point advantage or one point or a little extra 15 cents value that you get at the end of a season by consistently being able to shop at different uh, places and get it is important. You know, a lot of our successful players that play with us also play at a lot of other places again. And, you know, and that allows them the flexibility to shop around and always have the best line. Uh, you know, that's one of the things that makes somebody probably a winner. And you have to have the bankroll to sustain you know, substantial ups and downs, and, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I don't want to say what they all do. I want to <laughs> tell people the secret, of, you know, the few people that beat us. All right, well, Chad, I, why don't you, Chad, why don't you tell us the secret, because you hang out with these people. Well, I do, I, I do want you to explain, you know, he said the word algorithm, like, 17 times yeah. already. I feel like the over-under on algorithm in this conference was okay. about 50. 
Yeah. But, uh, this panel's probably so, 50. Yeah. And I'm sure like Mike is taking book on algorithm and some yeah. like notebook right now. Right. But um, I feel like, the, like Matt needs to explain the process for the algorithm because what the M is doing and what Cantor is doing is pretty advanced math in the bookmaking industry. And the machine that you're doing it with, there's this massive machine in the back of the M Resort called Midas that is sort of creating these algorithms <laughs> and spewing out every single number. And so you have this you know, magical mystery formula that creates this advantage for you guys. But it's not the only way you guys are manipulating the lines. No, it's not. You know, and it takes a lot of things into account. You know, we have a lot of exponential smoothing into where, where it uh, weighs heavily more on recent data than past data. Uh, we have player values for every player. I mean, it is really in-depth, the data that goes into the algorithms. But you're right, once the computer spits out a number, we also have some guys that are industry leaders in this industry, and they, you know, they help anticipate where the money's going to go. We have a lot of big clients. We have sharp clients. We have square clients. We see where they're, we know where they're betting, and it help kind of sets the tone. The betters themselves really set the tone is where we're going to go with it. You know, we do a great job of uh, player profiling where we know where our players are going to bet. You know, we have every player in a database, and we can anticipate what money we're going to take. An anticipatory effect is really important in sports, uh, you know, as a bookmaker side of it, is we have to kind of anticipate this is where the money's going to come in on us, and we want to be able to shade toward that, toward our algorithm, and toward where we expect to get money. What's the biggest bet you guys have taken? Uh, I, I'm not allowed to say. What Why I, not? It's, uh, no uh, we're not it's videotaping this. We can't this. disclose the... <laughs> Full bet. We will take pretty much. We take the largest bets in North America. If you want to walk in and bet a million dollars, uh, you're more than welcome. Can I bet five million? Uh, <laughs> possibly. Can Bob bet five million? Sure, <laughs> absolutely. So you'd rather take a bet from Bob than from Chad? Uh, I, I don't know that. You know the thing about Chad is we may not have a player profile as much on Chad, but we know where Bob's coming from, and uh, I'm still. You know we're going to probably anticipate. To be honest, we're, we anticipate where a sharp player is going to bet. If Bob comes in and he wants to bet a game, uh, you know we can move the line for Bob. You know as a bookmaker, we have the opportunity to put, benchmark whatever number we want. And it, as a sharp player, we normally know which side of the game the sharps are going to be on. So if Bob wants to come in and bet at whatever number we want to give Bob, then he can bet as much. You'll give him a number that's off the board. We, we can, you know, not everybody gets the same exact numbers. So I, so I, have, a, I have a question. If you, if you know that the Sharps... Oh, really, that's interesting, isn't that? Like, that's an advantage. Yeah. If you know that the Sharps are going to come in on one Bob. side of, of a line that you've made, that your algorithm has made, right, why wouldn't you shade the line so that the Sharps wouldn't want to be on that side? Well, sometimes our algorithm, you know, we are really confident in what our, the computer says the number should be. Just because we know the sharps are going to come on that side doesn't mean the sharps are always right. Uh, so, you know, sometimes we're just willing to absorb more risk on some situations than we are other games. So if the sharps are on a side where we feel like we're willing to absorb more risk on that, then we may not move it at all. Where if the sharps, we know we're going to come in on a side where we also feel like that side is bad, then obviously we're going to try to shade to get them away from it. So it is a myth that bookmakers want 50-50 action. It's 100% myth. Every bookmaker it's I know 100%. is a gambler. They're just playing yes. with the house's money, and they're looking to maximize the profit, but they're happy to be on one side, and whether it's Midas deciding what the number is and what the advantage is, or if it's a bookmaker who has a pretty good feel about what a game is, they're happy to go heavy, yes. and that's how you make money. You don't make it from... 50-50 split. Yeah, you know, in a dream world, it would be nice to have 50-50 and know exactly how much you're going to make and your, your hold be completely based on, you know, what your handle is. But that's not the reality of it, and it never will be the reality of it. And that's why we're so successful in, in Vegas compared to some of the other sports books who will take very small limits. And the reason they take very small limits is they don't have the advanced algorithms we do or advanced confidence in their line overall. So they take a lot more smaller limits. We're, we're willing to absorb a lot more risk because we're that confident. Essentially in Las Vegas we have the only number. We're the only place you can walk in in Las Vegas and bet a million dollars. You know nobody else you can. You walk into some of these books you can bet five, ten thousand dollars on a game and you can walk into any of Cantor's books at the M at the Venetian and bet a million dollars and we won't blink an eye because we're that confident in the numbers that we post. Midas. Uh, yeah that well. Midas, Midas is post. gold. <laughs> so, so whatever. Any. So let's, uh, let's talk about a real public game obviously. Let's talk about the Super Bowl this last year. 
So tell, tell me a little bit about how the betting played out in the Super Bowl. The, the Patriots were, what, minus three-ish? Yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, I think a lot of the sports books in Vegas made a little bit of money because of the props. And the props have such a high level of juice built in uh, that they have a really high hold percentage for the casinos. So the right. props are the reason that all the casinos made money. But there was a, you know, a significant amount of money on New, in, on New York Giants' money line this year. And that New York Giants' money line, essentially if the Patriots had have won that football game, even if they don't cover the spread, Las Vegas makes a lot of money on the Super Bowl. Instead, Las Vegas made a little bit of money on the Super Bowl only because of the props. But essentially, just on a side basis of the game, uh, you know, most of Las Vegas books lost on the side because there was so much Giants' money line money. Now... This brings up kind of an interesting point because we had talked a little bit about second half betting and that kind of thing and the way you make second half lines. Um, that second half line, I'm guessing, was an example of not necessarily what you guys wanted or thought would happen, but what you were worried about happening, i.e., so explain to me, explain yeah, to them a little bit about that. And that's actually one of the reasons why we feel like our algorithms are so good, too, is so many people build these you know, formulas that just have end game determinants in them. And one of the things that we do is since we really originated the in running in Las Vegas, we also, all of our algorithms are based play by play determinants, not just end of game determinants. So we really have a better feel throughout the game. Second half lines, a lot of times what happens is, and people forget this, they think this is the line for the game, this is the score at halftime, this should be the line for the second half. But you have to take into account too, how much you know risk you have on the game itself because you can't allow yourself to be stuck in a situation where the score is this you have this much risk pre-game and you allow these people to have a big middle to come in and win both sides right. so no matter what you think should happen at that point you also have to you know risk management becomes a really the key to setting second half lines so inherently was there value was there value in that second half line because of the position that you guys were in most likely yeah in that game there was because at that point we had to you know risk management the situation compared to it was no longer a matter of this is what the computer says the second half line is it's this is our risk for the game and this is you know where we need to take a position now so do you think that second halves, because of that, um, present a great opportunity for the gambler? Sometimes they do, uh, and I don't want to get over into it again because that could be a soft spot for us. But, uh, <laughs> you know, a lot of the public doesn't go, a lot of people don't go to bet second halves. You know, they want to bet the game. So fortunately for us, you know, that doesn't always happen, but it can be. And what happens is you, you get a first half that's extremely low scoring or extremely high scoring or an extreme blowout. You know, and it can cause a real differential in what a second half line should be, especially if a line was fairly close. Or, uh, and when you're trying to set a second half benchmark, essentially, you know, the computer is going to spit out pretty close to what you think should happen. But because of the risk you have associated with the game in the current situation, you're not necessarily going to post the number of what the computer is saying should happen. More of you're going to post a risk management position. Right. That's because most people betting the games are idiots, and that's why Dr. Bob still gets to make money. Yes, sir. <laughs> so, what, Doc, Bob, why don't you explain a little bit about your business itself and, and what you do and, and sort of like how you make your money, because I think that that'll be a good segue into the next Yeah, I, um, I started years ago when I was at Berkeley, studied statistics, and sort of stumbled into the business. I came up with something that's a little bit different, uh, using technical analysis to, to kind of study performance patterns and uh, kind of stumbled on something that was you know, interesting and, and kind of got me some notoriety. And, and some people in the business said, well, this is really kind of maybe groundbreaking potentially. And I got on a couple of radio shows, and then there's all this interest of where did I get your picks. And I'm like, well, I don't know. And one of the hosts says, well, you should get a 900 number, and you got to start selling your picks. And I said, all right. So that's kind of how I kind of got into the business. And since then, I've uh, you know, had a publication for years, but now everything's on the internet and I sell analysis to people who bet. And I've got you know, a number of syndicates that get my stuff too. Um, but you know, everybody pays the same. It's not that, you know, that expensive. You know, it's $15 a day for basketball and you know, 70 bucks a week for football. Um, so it's pretty affordable uh, you know, if you're betting a decent amount of money. And that's where I make, you know, that's where I make my money is, is on the business side. Now, in, in, the, uh, in the world of selling picks, which is this sorted kind of nasty world, right? I mean, you kind of rise above because of your use of analytics and whatnot, but 
Is it is it difficult for you? Like, well, one, I guess, why do you sell your picks if you're if you're so good? Why don't you just go to the M and bet a million dollars a game? That is with, a great question. Matt? Well, that's the question you get is, well, if you know, if I can make a million dollars selling picks, to make a million dollars betting, you know, at fifty, let's say I'm hitting, you know, I used to hit bigger percentages, but the lines have gotten tighter, and now, you know, if I'm hitting 54, 55 percent, that's as good as anyone, and that's that's you can make a good profit that way. But to make a million dollars a year, let's say, you need a bankroll that's pretty substantial. And that's the thing. And you couldn't, you know, you couldn't use your entire... Well, well, give us an example of what that bankroll is. You probably need, you know, two or three million dollar bankroll, you know... Um, to, make a hunt, to make a million? It, I think you need a bigger bankroll than that. Yeah, well, you do because you have to have a reserve bankroll because you can have that one I random... You, I think you need at least 50, 50 to 100 million dollars to make a to million, million dollars in a season. Yeah, I, you know, if you're only betting... Yeah, I mean, because you can't, put your whole, you can't put your whole bankroll at risk is the problem. You know, well, that, that's what I'm one, saying. Like, there's no year, way, like, you have one bad year and you wipe yourself out. Right. Is, 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 and it's going to happen. Just randomly, you're going to have a bad year. Um, so, yeah, you probably need, you know, I haven't done the math on it because I'm not, you know, I don't have $50 million to, <laughs> to, to, to gamble with. But. So what kind of, if you sell your picks, right, what, what kind of disadvantage does that put you in? Um, you know, there's different pressures. I, you know, I think I... I, I I'd probably do better if I didn't have the pressure of, of selling to people. And I think you, you know, as much as you try to stay strong-minded, I mean, there's going to be these times of negative variance where you're just going to, I mean, it happens. You could be a 55% handicapper for 20 years and go 8 and 30, you know, over a two-week period. And, and, and it's just going to happen over time. You're just going to have those bad streaks. But, you know, most gamblers don't understand variance, which is the frustrating thing for me is it's, it's going to happen regardless of what I do. I mean... Uh, you know, I do the same analysis when I'm losing as when I'm winning. It's just the only difference is variance. So people, will, you know, will inevitably like, what's going on? And you know, my my response is, variance is going on. I mean, you know, if uh, <laughs> you know, but most people don't understand. Gamblers definitely don't understand. You know, variance. They don't. Well, wanna, they don't want to hear it. Professional either, gamblers do. You're either hot or cold, and there's no such thing as hot or cold. I mean, my methods have worked for years, and I think they're going to work going forward. Maybe not to the degree they've worked in the past because the lines are getting tighter, but they're still going to work, you know, but there's going to be ups and downs, and you know, I don't worry about, you know, hot and cold doesn't exist to me. It's just positive variance and negative variance, and, you know, from this point forward, I feel I'm going to win, and, and, and convincing clients that that's sort of a, a problem sometimes when you're going through a bad streak, but inevitably when everybody leaves because you had a bad streak, that's when you start winning, because those, you know, but uh, it, it affects the way you, you know, if you've been on a bad run, you're starting to get hate mail, which happens. Uh, you know, I, I answer every, there might be people here that sent me hate mail before, but you know, I answer every single mail I get, you know, it's like, and try to educate people on, you know, having a long-term perspective. So, you know, I, I don't like gamblers, I like investors, um, but you're going to get gamblers, even though I have a lot of investors because of the way I, I earn my site, um, you know, but you're going to have guys who are just going to complain. You, you know, I, I had five winning weeks in a row and had one bad day, and I got three or four guys just ripping me. I'm like, yeah, yeah, you lost 10 stars today, but I was up 40 stars the last few weeks, so what's the difference? But I'm, I'm sorry about that note. But yeah, that was good. <laughs> um, but it does affect the way you pick the game sometimes. When you're, when you're going bad and you're starting to get to feel the heat, I, I maybe get too conservative, and that tends to be me. I tend to pull back a little bit. When I, you know, and, and sometimes the, the games that are hardest to bet are the, are the best bets you can make. And those might be the ones that, oh, God, if I release, if I give out the Charlotte Bobcats tonight, right. I, you know, I probably should. But, God, if they lose, I'm just going to, I'm never going to hear the end of it. So maybe I, you know, I pull back on some of the games I release when things are going bad. So it does affect. You don't, you don't get rich betting the Miami Heat, right? You get rich betting the Charlotte Bobcats. You get Bobcats. rich betting the, the, the Charlotte Bobcats. Yeah, the, 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 the teams that no one wants some to bet. It's a pretty ugly bet sometimes. Right. Do yeah, you feel compelled to put, to put out selections every single day? No. No, I, I, um, I, I pass often, you know, if there's nothing, well, early in the season especially, I'll pass a lot. And I don't really care. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't need the, you know, the daily clients. I don't necessarily need that business. I feel like that's what people don't understand is they hear professional gambler and they A, think you have a disease and B, think that you are betting every single game on the board every single day. And what I find is that professional gamblers are very selective about what they're choosing. And 
you know, they're going against Matt and his guys or against the Hilton or whomever, and they're just looking for the best opportunity. And if it's three games, that's three games. If it's 10 games, it's 10 games. Yeah. And on an NFL Sunday, it could be one game yeah. or no A games. Times, yeah. And they don't feel compelled to put their hand in their pocket just because they're professional gamblers. They're looking for the value. Yeah. And I've got clients, you know, where, you know, especially, you know, if I've been doing well and all of a sudden, you know, I'm releasing four or five games a week, let's say in college football, and I've been doing well, and all of a sudden there's a week that comes along and there's one game I like. I'll release the one game. People are like, well, you know, what are the other games you like? And I'm like, I like one game. Well, what else would you bet if you had to bet? I'm like, well, you don't have to bet. And people just want to, they want to, they want to press, you know? And I'm like, you know, well, flip a coin. I'm not going to start giving advice on games I don't want to, don't think you should be betting on. I mean, I sort of have a responsibility to my clients to give them games that I would personally bet. And I think a lot of handicappers just will throw out you know, as many games as possible to get business and have something every day that they're releasing. It's always on TV, you know, and I don't care if the game's on TV. Most of my games are Mid-American Conference or Ohio Valley or something. You know, that's where the value is in the smaller conferences, not in the TV games. Do you bet every game that you send a selection out for? Yeah. Do you bet, what do you do if the, so the number changes after you send out your selection. Do you send out another email saying the number changed, this is no longer a good choice? Well, the, 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 the game's all, the numbers release, always change. The numbers after always change. Right, releases, so then what do you do? They always I mean, change. Well, I have, I have, a, I have, out. I have a constraint. So I, you know, let's say that you know, I'm, I'm releasing UCLA minus six and a half or something. I'll say, you know, uh, bet it at minus seven or less. Because I'm, the line's going to move. But right. There are times when I know I might like it at seven or less, and it might be seven, and I know the line's going to go to seven and a half, but if you're not you know, on my site as the games are being released, you're not going to get minus seven. But that, you know, that's what's good about being a subscriber, is you get them as they're being released. Do you, do you guys move your lines based on his picks? We don't move our lines based on anybody's They rights. fear nobody. But, <laughs> but the market, but the market's going to... We have gonna, the utmost confidence in The market's going to move your line, though. What? The market's going to move your line. The market may, yes. Yeah. So if, yes. I release a, if I release a play, your line's moving. Maybe. It is. I guarantee it is. If it's not, okay, then you're going to get all the action on that uh, side. I'm not, maybe. I, I don't know that your players play with us. Or. So let's, let's go back to the tout business itself and sort of map... I, you know, I think that one of the things, I mean, in here, I assume that there's some um, bettors and gamblers and, you know, some probably of Dr. Bob's clients, but, you know, who, as you, as a, as a bookmaker, when you look at sort of the tout business itself, like, and look at the gamblers following touts and that kind of thing, like, what do you think of that business? And, and you know? uh, Well, I'm going to have the utmost respect for Bob, but unfortunately for Bob, and, and he's had to probably, you know, rise above this but the stereotypes of the industry and as someone who lives in Las Vegas can attest to as there's a lot of handicappers in Las Vegas the industry as a whole has a bad reputation and there's been some handicappers that maybe you know there's there are some high profile handicappers in Las Vegas where if you went up to them and their biggest client was Chad and you went up to that up to Chad and ask him who they released to him today and then went up to that handicapper and say hey, who did you release to your big client today? That handicapper may not be able to tell you who Chad's betting on today, even though Chad's his biggest client, and that's, you know, that's a part of the issue. It's I am many people's biggest client. Yeah. <laughs> How about you, Chad? You see touts all the time. What's, what's your take on it's the It's honestly the hardest part about the column and the podcast that I do is figuring out who's legit and who I can bring on and who I'm comfortable releasing on the public because it's as much my reputation and ESPN's reputation um, when I talk to people about who they like and the reasons they like them and when I, I've had this experience with guys where they're calling me, they're calling me, they're calling me and they're giving me, they, they want me to get them in the column or want me to have them in the podcast and I do my diligence and I end up doing something with them, and it's happened three or four times where it was a huge, huge mistake. And I went against my better judgment, and uh, you pay for it. You pay for it in, in nasty emails, from, like, like Bob is saying. You know, people, 
when they've been ripped off, they are pissed. And there are some people, there, there's, I'd say there's four or five people in the industry who consistently, if you mention their name, it is gonna cause trouble. Bob's not one of them, Bob I talk to all the time, and he's great, and he actually has a stellar reputation. Um, but it is tricky, and it's scary. I mean, I, I, it happens constantly, and I get nervous whenever I have a guy on that I haven't had before, just because I'm antsy about what the ramifications might be. So let's, uh, let's shift out of the Tau business now that we've gone down that path and talk a little bit back to sort of analytics and stats and things like that. Um, what are some you know, interesting or, or some underrated, I know you don't want to give away too many secrets, but try to give us some things that the, the public might not know about or might underrate, you know, things like travel or altitude or referees or things like that. Yeah, sure. All those that you just said, travel, travel is a huge one, you know, uh, teams traveling across the country, in college, especially in college, some of these kids just aren't used to the travel demands that, you know, they get put on them and, uh, you know, they have a lot more things going on, you know, trying to go to school and your girlfriends and you're emotionally a little different and you're not used to the, the but, you know, the So do you guys know that team. kind of stuff? You know, sometimes, uh, you know, we factor in travel a little more for college than we do professional. Uh, but, you know, I, think, I don't necessarily know that betters take advantage of it. I think one of the things that public betters tend to overrate is weather. You know, people get really into this, oh, it's snowing, the game has to go under, and all of a sudden you see these massive line drops because of uh, weather and football, and it ends up being irrelevant. You know, how many times have you seen a game where there's a little bit of snow and the ball's not even slippery, it doesn't affect the outcome at all, but because it's snowing, uh, there's a really massive overreaction to weather a lot of times. Uh, you know, wind is actually a lot bigger factor than snow or rain is uh, to, a, you know, the NFL nowadays and the way that the passing games are. Can I just say one thing? Sure. I disagree about the travel for college basketball. Okay. I feel like, and, I, and Bob can certainly weigh in on this, but a lot of guys that I talk to, they used to feel that way, and they continued to feel that way, and they incorporated travel into their power rating, and they kept getting beat because as the season went on, at you know what, what gamblers call the situations where they should be getting an advantage because... They've got a team that had a Tuesday game, and then it's a, you know, they're Thursday. Then they got a Thursday game, and they're traveling from Iowa to East Lansing, and they should be tired. They're not, because the college basketball players now are playing travel games from the time they're eight years old. And so there's a lot less, um, they're more machine-like and less emotional about travel than they used to be. At least guys I talk to have been sure, saying that. Sure, that may be uh, true in some cases, but you still, uh, you know, get oftentimes where people get, uh, you know, they play these tournaments a lot of times, and that may be true, they're a little bit more used to it, but all of a sudden you're going from playing a home game in Iowa to playing in Hawaii for three, four games in three nights, and then you have to fly back to the United States to play a game two days later back in, you know, Minnesota somewhere, and those things can be just... I'm just saying you might want to tweak Midas' formula because okay. I'm come on, I got come on hours. You're welcome to come out. I'm going to bet that okay. Indiana at Michigan State okay. game. Okay, come on. That stuff gets incorporated in the line, though. I mean, yes. four days in sure. Hawaii, and then you go across the country to play an East Coast game two days later. I mean, everybody's, everybody's looking for a reason to bet a game, whether yes. it's valid or not. Oh, that team played overtime last night. Well, the odds no makers know that team played overtime, yes. triple right. overtime last night. It's in the line. So there's no advantage to that, you know. Um, altitude is something I've studied in college sports um, and teams that play at high altitude, you know, 4,000 feet above sea level or higher, when they're playing teams from sea level, uh, they do have a bigger advantage. You know, Denver uh, and from the Sun Belt, no one else from the Sun Belt is at altitude at all. And Denver has a huge home court advantage against Sun Belt teams. You know, non-conference, not so much, because they're playing Wyoming, and they're playing teams, Colorado State, and they're playing teams that are also altitude teams. You know, and, and, and teams like UNLV, Nevada, you know, because they're playing Big West teams from Long Beach State and Pacific, who are playing, you know, uh, at sea level. Those teams have, a, have more of a home, uh, home court advantage at altitude. So, I mean, I that's love, something I do incorporate in. I love listening to, to wise guys talk about teams, because we as fans are thinking about Duke, North Carolina tonight, yeah. and Bob is thinking about Denver, and like another guy is thinking about Middle Tennessee State, and they are living and dying with these teams that, no, that are nobodies 
radar. Well, I guarantee the line on Duke, North Carolina is sharper than the line on Absolutely. Elon College in Charleston, you know, I mean. <laughs> yes, Are you pushing that game? Say. Yes. It's a line game for sure. Yeah. So, uh, Bob, uh, some questions from the crowd. How valuable is historical data? And I think, Matt, you probably have some, uh, something good on this, too. And is, is there an expiration date where it is no longer relevant? Um, so well, how, how, mu how much time, I guess, how much time do you put into your models? Uh, well, uh, most of my models use, I, I've done some tests on whether it's, you know, if you're doing in-season models, whether it's season to date or last six weeks or should there be a, a recency factor. The, the difference in the models is not that, there's, there's hardly a difference between when I'm using season to date stuff and whether I'm using the last six week stuff. I mean, I adjust my models for current personnel, so I think that sort of takes into account recency more than maybe other people's models who don't, who don't adjust for stuff like that. Um, so for my models, it's about the same, but I think in general, I've heard a lot of people say hey, the last six weeks is probably a little bit more representative than the whole season. You know, if they're not taking into account current personnel, then it probably would be. But I'm, I'm, I look at the whole season, especially in football. I mean, you don't want to, you know, it's only 16 games. You don't want to throw away data. Um, you know, if a team has changed somehow, I want to look to see, you know, how they've changed. You know, San Francisco 49ers, we were talking about left guard being hurt. You know, when Rashal was a starting guard for the Niners, they were giving up, you know, five sacks a game. And even the preseason, they were horrible. Adam Snyder comes in. All of a sudden, they're getting sacked one and a half times a game. Snyder gets hurt against the Ravens. Rashal comes back in. They give up nine sacks or something ridiculous. You know, I mean, one position like that can make a difference. So when I did the 49ers stuff in my math model, once it became apparent that the change in the offensive line made a difference, then I just started, I just threw out the games offensively, you know, with, with when Rashal was starting. I only used the games when Snyder was starting. You know, so I make adjustments like that. Um, so Snyder is worth more than Alex Smith. Uh, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, maybe. What, um, Matt, in terms of like the historical models and things like that, I think that one thing that gamblers can struggle with is the stability over time of their models and things like yeah, that. Yeah, we put a big emphasis on exponential smoothing where we try to have more you know, data from recent seasons uh, be weighted heavier in the models than data from past seasons. I mean, the NFL is a perfect example of how the rules changes and everything can play a huge effect on how the game is played. So you have to take that into consideration. I think having a, you know, a model that uses a lot of exponential smoothing and sort of weighing heavier that recent data is always going to be a little more applicable to what's happening now uh, and give you a little bit better grasp of how you know, your de end game determinants. So Chad, a question for you. You mentioned that you received dozens of spreadsheets through email. What's the best model you received that you remembered and what's the worst that you remember? Uh, well, I, I, there's a guy who I talk to a lot uh, who goes by the name The Sports Boss. And uh, he's a guy who got an MBA, I think from Villanova, and he works in finance in Philly. And um, he is sending me these spreadsheets that are as advanced, as advanced as anything I've seen. I've written about him in the column a couple of times, and I just wrote about him, I think it was the end of the football season, because his models were phenomenally accurate based on his, at, when you reached a certain level in his power rating. And his, his, he had these statistical regression models that honestly I don't even understand. And when I'm on the phone with him, I'm on the phone with him for an hour trying to figure them out. Um, and they're great, and I love them. And it's one of those things where I want to continue to see how he develops, because he's at the early stages of his career, and I want to see, does he have a talent for this? Did he get lucky for a year? And, it, that's when it gets exciting, is you feel like you're on the verge of finding something that's really fascinating. Um, God, there's so many bad ones, Jeff. It's just like, <laughs> you know, it's like, I, it's like, I just got one the other day, and they, they come in constantly. It's like, I'm working on this model. It's about, honest to God, they are like, my mom loves this team. I hate this team. Therefore, X equals Y. I'm going with Z. And I swear to God, <laughs> I, this guy is probably moving numbers at the M right now. There's no doubt about it. 
So that's a good segue to, and I think I know the answer to this question, Matt, but I'll ask you anyways. How many bets or dollars does it take to move, move a line or change a price? Uh, you know, there is no set amount, and sometimes it doesn't take any money at all. Uh, information can move a line quicker than money. You know, we don't need money to move a line if we get information that a player is out, information there's severe weather or... Uh, you know, we're not going to wait for money to come in before we move the line. We can anticipate that we're going to get bet toward that. You know, if we find out LeBron's not playing, we're going to move it before we ever take a bet, uh, if possible. You know, we don't want to, it doesn't necessarily take money. So that's sort of an imaginary myth that there's some, you know, numeric number associated with the line movement because there isn't. Let's see. Offshore books compete with one another by reducing the VIG from minus 10 to minus 08 to minus 05. Why don't you guys have to do this in Vegas? Uh, we don't have any competition in Vegas. You know, we just, we're the premier sports book. We're the only sports book that offers the in running to the advanced stages that we do. We have the tablets. You can come buy one of our books, sign up for an account, get a tablet, go to any sports book you want in Vegas, take it with you, bet anywhere in Nevada, sit by the pool, sit in your room and bet. Uh, you know, we'll take any limits. You can walk in and bet a million dollars. Um, because of the fact of, you know, what we offer compared to the rest of the sports books in Las Vegas, we, you know, we don't have any competition, really. Can I call BS on that? Yeah, go ahead, try. <laughs> but, because, I mean, there's a lot of good sports books out there. Sure. Um, it's not like you never adjust your juice. We don't give breaks on VIG. We don't have VIG breaks. But you won't adjust your juice based on, you won't move a number so it goes from, instead of moving it from minus three to minus three and a half, you won't move the juice instead. No, no what he's talking That's about, different. what he's talking about well, is these sports question? books give reduced Oh, reduced juice, okay, I missed To I compete misunderstood. with each other. Okay. We don't give in that case, he's still the getting the same juice, right. he's just putting it on yeah. the other side. I misunderstood. Okay. I apologize. So, uh, thanks for just derailing that job. conversation, Chad. <laughs> uh, Chad, you, I know this is... I was still stuck in my formula. I'm like, can this guy really win any money doing this? <laughs> <laughs> Chad, I know that this is something that was kind of interesting to you. This, the, social, the effect of social phenoms like Tim Tebow or yeah. Jeremy Lin and what impact that has on the line. It was crazy. I mean, Matt could talk to this and Bob could talk to this too, but the effect, certainly on Jeremy Lin, you know, the, the Knicks futures dropped from 40 to 1 to 20 to 1. And there was a while there where, you know, the Knicks were overvalued because yes. people were rushing to bet the Knicks. And it was the same with Tebow. And then what happened was with Tebow was even more interesting because there was all this money coming in on Tebow on the future side. And then on the, on the sides, people were betting the Broncos. And then all of a sudden, he had these bad games at the end of the year. And so going into the playoffs... You know, the line shot up against the Steelers. I think it shot up from like minus 7 to minus 10, something like that. And then all of a sudden there was buyback. And because everybody was seeing, wait a second, there's no way the Steelers can be 10 point favorites in Denver with the injuries, with, they, with have. The injuries they have. And like it had become, it had gone from so pro Tebow to so anti Tebow. But what happened was with the futures, especially, you know, a lot of people would say, oh my God, the Giants were 20 to 1 favorites to win the Super Bowl. And all this money was bet on the Giants, and the books must have gotten killed on this. But people forget there's 31 other teams that people are betting on, and all this money had come in on Tebow. And so the books were like, this is a boon, a boon for us. I thought, I thought it was a great, it was like a great betting story. Both of those guys sure. were great examples of the public influence on the markets and how, how, much, a st how much star power can attract dollars. And how much liability something like that can cause to a sports book. Uh, you know, there was a couple of sports books in Las Vegas who had some liability on the Giants. And another good example is the Cardinals. Who, uh, you know, there were some sports books in Las Vegas who had some real liability with the Cardinals winning because of the odds they had to overcome to even get to the playoffs. And, right. But yeah, a team like the Knicks, who they were such a big underdog to win, and their actual odds of winning, you know, are low. But now all of a sudden, you have, because of Jeremy Lin, you have substantial Knicks futures money all of a sudden at 40, 30, 25 to 1. Uh, you know, they're a real liability if somehow they right. actually could get there. And it's and happening get it now done. with Peyton Manning. Like, where's Peyton Manning going to end up? So you see even teams as remote as Seattle have probably dropped from maybe 50 to 1 to 20 to 1. I don't sure. know what your futures were. But you're seeing it. That's where you start to see who has a real impact in the value of particular players. So futures bets are kind of interesting, right? Because futures bet, in, in general, you can't really bet the other side. So you guys can make a line that really is not a fair line. 
right? So how do you balance that? I assume the reason that you don't make, I, I assume that, well, futures bets are horrible, right? I mean, like these teams are 100 to 1 or 200 to 1 where they really should be 1,000 to 1 or 2,000 to 1. Well, in reality, every team in the NFL's true odds would be 1 to 32, 32 to right. 1. That would right. be their true odds right. in reality. So I don't know, know what to, reality you're living in. Yeah, but I'm just saying, you know, <laughs> that's their true odds. Right. True odds is a 1 in 32 chance of winning. Right. So, I mean, uh, yeah, the, the thing about futures and the thing that makes futures good and bad, the thing that makes good fu futures good for a sports book is we don't offer, you know, we offer team to win the Super Bowl, but we don't offer the other side of that bet, which would be team not to win the Super Bowl. So, of course, that's why they're a good bet. But, I mean, we don't offer that because the line would have to be so substantial. If a team's 50 to 1 to win the Super Bowl, they would have to be minus 7,500 to not win the Super Bowl. So, yes, since we don't offer that, the lines are often not exactly what they should be. Uh, but people can have real liability with the futures. There are some people that lost a lot of money because of the St. Louis Cardinals. A couple of years ago, the Tampa Bay Devil Rays, when they won the East, there was a lot of, there were some books that had some 100 to 1, 200 to 1 liability with Tampa Bay. Uh, it's something that we take very seriously because the odds are always so big. You know, you're talking 20, 50, 100 to 1. Although they may not be the odds that people think they should get, they also can cause a lot of liability for a sports book if not handled appropriately. Is, is the, why, why do you guys keep them as high as they are then in certain situations? Is that a competitive thing with other books to attract attention? Or? It is a competitive thing, and uh, it's one of the things where it's one of the few places in, you know, currently right now where you can get big variants. You know, normally if a game tonight, uh, you know, you look at one of the basketball games, if the line is three, the line's going to be three everywhere. You might see a three and a half, you might see a two and a half, but pretty much across the board it's going to be three. But with futures odds, you know, you could, you know, one place could have the Knicks 50, 50 to one and another book could have them 10 to one because of the risk they already have on the Knicks. So futures odds is one of the few places where a player can actually still shop around and see significant price differentials. Well, so I, I think we're just about done. We have a minute left, um, and I figured uh, since we have a minute left and we made all these people come here at 9 a.m., Bob, can you give us a, a pick for the day? Oh, God. <laughs> I actually haven't slept. I, I was up the entire night working on the basketball today. Um, let me think. Well, I, I can't give out something before I release it, and the line's going to move before I release it. So Matt, you can doesn't, see. Matt doesn't think it's going to move. <laughs> you can give us one pick. It will. Uh, Let's see. What's a what's a good game? What's what's a big game? Well, I'm not going to do North Carolina Duke. I know I'm not going to do that. Uh, how about how you know about what? Wichita State? All right. It's minus. I, I don't know what the line is. I'm guessing it's going to be around 10 against yeah. Illinois State. Yeah. Well, they were in a really bad situation yesterday and still blew out Indiana State. Uh, and they've what now covered seven in a row. They're just. They're just rolling. I mean, I think it's a good situation uh, uh, tonight. Uh, minus, minus 10 or so, I think the line should be around 12. And it's probably 10 is what I'm guessing. So we'll see if it's 10 or less. I think that's probably a pretty good bet. All right, you heard it here. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks,